More than 15,000 scientists are sounding an alarm about climate change. They call it a warning to humanity. Hurricane Maria has joined the growing list of major hurricanes to impact the Caribbean and the U.S. in recent weeks. Hurricanes Harvey and Irma drew national headlines before Maria struck, and each storm brought devastation in the form of severe wind and dangerous flooding. Now, all eyes are on the United States in the lead up to the climate change talks in Bonn, Germany. We begin today in California, where powerful winds and bone dry conditions are fueling massive wildfires. The problem is not human beings, the problem is capitalism. It's a more specific iteration of human environment interaction. It's not simply human environment interaction the way that the Anthropocene suggests. This is Christian Parenti, and you're listening to Left Out. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Left Out. I'm Michael Palmieri and I'm joined by the return of Dante Delaval mm -hmm. after a long hiatus. It's been too long. I'm glad to be back. Mike. Dante, we're, we're happy to have you back as well. Our colleague Paul Slyker is currently absent for this little introduction, but he is present on our interview that we conducted for this episode. Mm -hmm. But uh, before we jump into the episode, we, we really just want to extend our, our greatest thanks and enormous gratitude to you, our listeners. Uh, we're super appreciative of all of you who tuned into our last episode, our first of season two of Left Out with David Harvey. Uh, the support we received from subscriptions to our Patreon account was truly what kept us going. It was great to see their support out there. And we just really want to thank all of you who were able to contribute or subscribe to the podcast. And even if you haven't had the means to do so in terms of a contribution, please subscribe to our Patreon, get all the latest episodes. Um, or wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, just even if you can't contribute a large amount, even a very small amount goes a long way. It just ensures that we can continue to produce content that we believe, and hopefully you do too, is indispensable for understanding and analyzing our economy, society, and uh, getting all of this out to a wider and wider audience. Um, as always, we'll leave a link to our Patreon page in the, so in the show description. And hopefully you click on it. Yeah, definitely. Yep. We're really happy to have um, all this support. It's really overwhelming. Um, so today we have a really special guest. Um, Christian Parenti has a PhD in sociology from the London School of Economics. He's a professor over um, at the Global Liberal Studies Program at NYU. Um, he's written extensively on the connection between climate change and geopolitical conflict around the globe. And he's reported from war zones in Afghanistan. Uh, he's reported from Iraq, parts of Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Uh, he's done remarkable work. We're really glad to have him today. His articles uh, have appeared in uh, Fortune, The Washington Post, The New York Times, Middle East Report, London Review of Books, Mother Jones, and The Nation, where he's actually a contributing editor. Um, so, and I also believe that he's going to be teaching, um, at CUNY at, uh, John Jay College at the Economics Graduate, uh, program that I'm currently, uh, attending, Mike. So that Look should be, that. that should nice. be awesome over yeah, in, uh, in the springtime. So that's going to be really a, a treat for everybody over there at, at John Jay. Yeah. Uh, Christian Parenti is, is quite an interesting man. And as a development of a lot of his, his reporting in 2011, he was able to author a book. Um, titled The Tropic of Chaos, in which he explored how climate change is already causing violence as it interacts with the legacies of economic liberalism and Cold War militarism. Uh, the book also involves several years of travel and research and conflict zones in the global south. And his latest piece uh, of work is featured in a compilation of sorts titled Anthropocene or Capitalocene? Question mark, nature, History, and the Crisis of Capitalism, which is a series of provocative essays on nature, power, humanity, and capitalism, um, which is framed in a politics of hope that, and this is what I love the most, uh, 
talk about the possibilities for transcending capitalism. In our interview, we were able to ask Christian what it was like to, to straddle the realm between academia and journalism, uh, the prospects of climate catastrophe, the issue not only of climate change, but climate justice, and most important, the role of politics and the state in any real solutions for a just way forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we hope that you're as excited as we were to sit down with Christian um, and talk to him about these really pressing issues. So without further ado, uh, here's Left Out with Christian Parenti. So how did your upbringing shape your political perspective and the work that you're passionate about now? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so my mother wasn't really that political. She's sort of political. She's kind of like a bohemian. And, um, but my dad was red-baited out of academia because he was a communist and was also because he's a working class Italian kid from East Harlem, belligerent, and didn't back down and picked fights about the key questions that red baiting spun on, like uh, actually existing socialism in various forms and defending it. So he, as a result of him being red baited and never getting tenure, he, uh, he was... Um, he had to freelance for a while when I was growing up, and things were, in, long story short, things were economically uh, not that easy, and I had a, I was raised with like a suspicion, so I had an academic for another, a father, but not a, like an academic childhood, you know, universities and disciplines were the enemy in many ways, and um, yeah, and so I was, you know, I was uh, raised going to protests and stuff like that, and and then on living with my mother, I lived in southern Vermont in a, a kind of uh, kind of bohemian town where there were a lot of radicals and a kind of whole alternative, you know, back to the land movement. And like I went to a one room schoolhouse, one of the last one room schoolhouses in Vermont, that where the teacher was this woman named Clara Oglesby who was like constantly at war with the, the Board of Education because she was basically like in this public school that was, you know, like, you know, I mean, like 70% rednecks and, you know, 30, well, more like, you know, 40% Yankee, I use the term redneck endearingly, right? Like maybe 40, 50% redneck, maybe like kind of five or 10% bougie types. And then the rest being these kind of dropout hippie kids she ran this essentially like, I don't know, like a Montessori school or some sort of alternative ed thing. And the, the Board of Education hated her. So, yeah, my, my upbringing was pretty unorthodox. And politics was a, came across like a, um, you know, felt like a big adventure. But one in which there were, you know, pretty high stakes. And so, um, but w I guess what it, what it probably did was, set me on a path of, of something between journalism and academia. And that from early on, it seemed quite natural that there was problems with both journalism and academia. And so, uh, you know, I've, I've tread a, a, a course through that. All right. So Christian, you, you have quite an interesting career, which perhaps uh, helps explain your approach to writing and political action. Uh, you began as a journalist reporting in areas like Iraq, Afghanistan, India, etc. You then placed one foot in academia, publishing books covering far-ranging topics. Still today, you keep a foot in each space. Can you give us a quick intro about this journey from field reporting to academia? Yeah, <clears throat> well, it began uh, because I'm, I'm dyslexic. I'm severely dyslexic. And so I was slow uh, to learn to spell, let alone learn to write. And, and so I graduated high school with like not being able to write that well. And I didn't go to college immediately because I didn't want to. And uh, I lived in Boston. I worked in a shelter for homeless alcoholics. It was like the only wet shelter in Cambridge. And then I went out to California and um, went to college, a little college, it later collapsed. I was like moving furniture and in and out of college, dropped out of college. It was like 25 by the time I finished college. And so to learn how to write, I got into journalism. And I did that through KPFA, had an apprenticeship program. Um, and I was always 
you know, aware of the limitations of journalism, that there's this, uh, you know, that there's this, this conceit that everything is new. A lot of things aren't new. You know, a lot of what the news is, is just the latest iteration of a deep pattern that's old. And you, you can't pitch that to journalists be like, hey, here's the latest iteration of, you know, one of the patterns that's part of the metabolism of global capitalism. It's like, that's not it. It's going to be like, <laughs> this is the first time they've ever done X. So that, you know, that's a problem with journalism. And um, I was always interested in ideas and uh, history. So I, and, uh, and I was in Central America where I started out doing foreign reporting was in Central America in the early 90s before I had gotten my BA learning Spanish and reporting. And long story short, met a British woman there who convinced me to apply to the London School of Economics and I got funding. So I went and did a PhD, but was still always reporting. And then I did, um, and I had, and I'd done some conflict reporting in Central America because out of a freak connection to Southern Vermont, there were very few Americans who ever like traveled with the FMLN in El Salvador, but one of them was from Southern Vermont. And I was in a, the largest protest that had happened in Guatemala since the coup in 1991. And I started talking to this woman and she was Salvadorian. And I almost didn't say, do you know this person I know who's in El Salvador? And, but I did, and it turned out she knew this person I was talking about. And so through that got uh, the opportunity to go up into Cabanas, into the hills and hang out with the FMLN for a little bit towards the end of the war there. And um, so then after graduate school, I did a little like kind of post-conflict reporting in the Balkans. And then I came to New York. Um, and I lived in San Francisco for a lot of this, even though I went to graduate school in London and was writing for the Bay Guardian there and writing about criminal justice. And that was partly because of living on and off in San Francisco in the Mission District in the, starting in 1989, early 90s. Uh, there was like lots of violence and lots of police activity and my leftist friends and I didn't have a good explanation for this because you know the repression wasn't against a movement there was movements and they were also repressed but you know that wasn't what was driving this build up so all that became my my first book and, and part of my my thesis and then I was um, from very early on I had read David Harvey's work and so I wanted to study with David Harvey, and I got some postdocs, uh, and I took that funding and came to CUNY Graduate Center. That was in like the early 2000, 2002. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then with the blessing of David Harvey and uh, Neil Smith, who expected they were going to have some academic uh, postdoc there, I was kind of allowed to just go and do conflict reporting in Iraq and Afghanistan. And the reason I did that in part was because there was a moment with the war in Afghanistan when it first began where a certain type of uh, pro-interventionist, liberal intellectual, like David Reif, who's really, whose politics have improved a lot since this moment that I'm describing, um, were saying, well, if you don't go and see these conflicts, then you really can't comment. And I, I was like, well, I'm not going to be denied the ability to comment on the latest iteration of American imperialism by not going. So I went and then that turned into a kind of like about 10 years of conflict reporting. And then that ended very, almost like out of literature. I had an epiphany while pitching a journal, uh, an editor from a big men's magazine, Esquire, trying to try explain to him uh, about the floods in Pakistan and why. And I had funding that I had gotten through a, a prize that a photographer and I had won together, the Lang Taylor award and I was like you know trying to get them interested in going sending me to cover displacement and these floods and climate change and the guy was like yeah maybe if you could find an American aid worker in one of these IDP camps that you could profile and I just realized like at that minute I was like you know I don't I don't want to read this article let alone spend this money that I won and you know risk my safety going to report and I was like I just I have to get get back to academia so and now I'm happily back at academia after a series of academic jobs, different places. I'm now at John Jay, which is a, an excellent school. Well, I was going <clears> to, <throat> you know, that, that uh, little anecdote about them asking you to do a piece that would follow an aid worker um, kind of gets to... What an you American mean, aid an worker. An American aid worker, you're right. <clears throat> um, kind of gets to what we hear so much about 
which supposedly is in journalism, um, objectivity, right? In both the idea of objectivity in both journalism and academia. And uh, oftentimes this objectivity usually translates into being uncritical. Um, how do you deal with this in your work? And uh, what do you think about those who claim at all to be perfectly objective? I mean, is that even something anyone could reach? Yeah, no, objectivity is, is not possible. Um, but, you know, reporters can be balanced and mainstream reporters aren't balanced. That's the problem, right? They like, they, they exclude whole stories. Uh, I rarely listen to NPR, but right after these recent elections, I was, you know, listening to NPR, waiting to hear news of Lee Carter, the, the young guy in the suburbs of DC and Virginia who the Democratic Party, you know, refused to support because he had Bernie Sanders style politics and he won and he, you know, took the seat of the 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 GOP uh, House of Delegates. You know, whip. this is a, a DSA member, I believe, right? I think his membership in, in yeah. I don't know whether he's a DSA member, oh, okay. but he was definitely backed by DSA. Yeah, yeah. backed by DSA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so mm -hmm. I mean, if you were to be objective about those elections, you'd be like, oh, and this is interesting. Like the first transgender person, and this, and th and this guy who calls himself a socialist, and it was just like, you know not in there. I think it was one mention throughout the new, multiple news hours. But yeah, so yeah, mainstream journalism is not, um, is not balanced in terms of covering things. But in terms of objectivity, in terms of like a kind of rigorous empiricism uh, and, and uh, allegiance to the facts, that, that is possible and that's, you know, that's important. And if one does that, that's crucial to critical thinking, where you, you cannot just look for the facts that confirm your uh, suppositions. And frequently you'll find the best and most creative ideas come from rethinking your assumptions. And often that has to do with um, listening to your opponent's ideas. So here's an example of this. I was, when I first started writing about prisons, one thing I wrote about was prison labor. And at first, and one of the first thing I ever published for The Nation, where I'm still a contributing editor, ended up as a front page story about prison labor. And, and it was like, you know, just coming back this in the late 90s. And, and the critique then, as it is now, which is erroneous, is that prison labor was being driven by corporate profit making. And the fact of the matter is that corporations don't really like prison labor. And why is that? It's because there's so much cheap labor that's, you know, violently disciplined on the outside. Why would you want to go into a prison where you have to deal with prison guards and prison bureaucracy and all this, you know, all this other stuff. And so, Firms go in and then they come out of prison. It, prison's a very hard place to make a profit. But I was like trying to push for this, like, you know, what I seemed, seemed to make sense. Like, oh, yeah, like, uh, this is a profitable way to exploit labor. And, you know, the, the facts just weren't coming up. And, um, you know, finally, I, you know, just started listening to the justifications of the people who were promoting prison labor and their excuses as to why it wasn't bigger. And you realize, like, oh, these are, these are the real problems that capitalists face. They don't want to be in, in, inside prison. And so I just listened to these promoters of prison labor. They're like, look, well, it's, hard to, it's really hard to compete. Like the apparel industry, you know, they're, they wouldn't say sweatshops, right? They'd say, but they're, you know, maybe they did say sweatshops trying to make themselves seem better. Like, you know, there are sweatshops in downtown L.A. right near the port that pay minimum wage. And we're out here in the desert, you know, and, like, if you're going to sew T-shirts together out here in the desert and you've got to deal with all this hassle, I was like, oh. This is, uh, this is the truth, you know. I've totally different politics from these people, but they're explaining something real. And then, I, you know, leaning into that, I realized, okay, this is, this is not what's driving prison labor. Uh, first of all, prison labor is not, not expanding that much. The discourse of prison labor is being driven by people who want to try and make prisons seem cost-effective. And it's not, see? I mean, capitalism, there, there are numerous things in capitalist society that cannot be done by the private sector. Right? This is the Polanian mm -hmm. argument about there always needs to be an outside of capital. For, you know, capitalism, capitalist society, isn't just the same as capital, the process. It's the whole society. And much of that society isn't yet subsumed by capital accumulation and, and the logic of capital. And it, society can't function if that happens. Thus, we have socialized roads, we have socialized waste disposal, we have you know, socialized imperial war making, we have socialized domestic repression. And if firms can profiteer off that, great. But like, the idea that, that that whole public infrastructure, which reproduces the society off of which capital 
feeds parasitically, that capital could actually mediate all of those relationships is a dangerous utopian idea. It, it could never and will never happen. Mm -hmm. And then I guess, you know, the idea of, uh, to get back to your point of a journalist looking at that pattern, um, that would make a lot of the, the headline grabbing stories pretty dull and that they, you know, fit into that one general trend. Right. Um, you're a sociologist by training, but you currently teach in the econ department at CUNY. Can you speak to why uh, any economics student would need to understand sociology? I mean, we're taught that econ is about markets and the allocation of resources. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I got my PhD in a sociology department, but I was also co-supervised under geography. So it was like urban sociology and criminology was what I first studied. So um, yeah, uh, in terms of economics, the economics profession, as I think you all have done well on your show uh, with other interviews, you know, is has has really failed as a, a discipline that offers a social critique. And it can't even, in many cases, perform in the terms that it has laid out for itself, witness the last financial crash, right? And how the economics discipline was incapable of really predicting that by and large and, and explaining it. So, um, yeah, but the tradition that I, that I feel is, that I feel closest to is political economy and, you know, historical materialism. So there's no explanation that matches the real history of events, right? So that's what uh, I hope to bring into, you know, bring to my students. And, you know, the disciplines, these disciplines are, they are what they are. They're all, they're all kind of a mess. And um, while at John Jay we have some very serious economists, we also have economists who are highly critical of the discipline, and thus, you know, I'm not actually not the only non-economist in the, the program. And I think the main thing we're trying to do is bring in people, as you said, but also history and also geography, space, right? Like th these economic patterns take place quite literally. They have a relationship to physical space and therefore political power and biophysical reality, AKA nature, right? Having been a journalist covering conflicts across the globe, you make a clear connection between violence, international conflict, and climate change. Climate change. In your book, Tropic of Chaos, you outline how climate change was already contributing to the exacerbation of violence in countries left decimated uh, by the Cold War and, and neoliberal reform. I remember your analysis of poppy production in Afghanistan being a cogent example of how these forces combined to create more violence. Can you please explain in, in short that thesis and give some examples, perhaps recent ones that have occur occurred since the publication of your book in 2011? I'm thinking Syria, Egypt, Yemen, mm -hmm. Libya. Yeah. So, well, the, the thesis of Tropic of Chaos is that climate change is already a driver of violence. And I mean, part of why I wrote that book was because I, I, I didn't want these analyses to be done only by right wingers who were on top of this this set of questions in many ways from the early 90s on and their solution was always you know more u.s intervention um so but in a nutshell the argument is that climate change rarely if ever acts in isolation to cause violence it always causes violence by interacting with pre-existing crises and those are the legacy of cold war militarism which has littered the global south with cheap weapons and people know how to use them, and the legacy of neoliberal economic restructuring, which has created increased economic inequality, driven down economic growth in many places, not every place, but most places it's been applied, and uh, has, in every place, weakened the state's capacity to respond to emergencies like droughts and floods. And so, in response to the extreme weather associated with climate change, People are adapting by turning to the state, seeing that it is not there to help them or that it is hostile to them, and then turning to the guns and the weaponry and the expertise that is left behind by the Cold War and now increasingly by the war on terror. And so place after place, we see this pattern. And in terms of you know, the specifics of your question, yeah, um, the Arab Spring was very much structured by this catastrophic convergence of and really what it was, was the, the droughts and flooding in major grain producing regions the year before the Arab Spring, 
Uh, there was the Black Sea drought in particular, which affected Russia, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine and uh, hammered their wheat crops. And then Russia canceled its wheat export contracts. This is leading up to 2011. Long story short, they're the largest grain importing region in the world is the Middle East. Egypt was the largest single wheat importer. And so if you look back at those protests, they they begin with broad sets of demands, but central to all of these was lowering the price of food. And you see in that how an environmental crisis in one place can be transmitted through markets to another place and then shows up as political and then, you know, religious conflict. And it's not to reduce it to the environmental roots, but to say that that's a component in it. So there's that. I mean, in Syria, there was major drought, just as the Assad regime was liberalizing the economy. So all these Sunni farmers leave the land, arrive partly because there's no assistance for them out there. They arrive in cities where, similarly, the social safety net is being cut back. They start protesting. It, it, it looks like this religious conflict between the Alawite elite, the Sunni majority, you know, it quickly spins out of control into this military conflict. Again, it's not to reduce it to the drought, but, you know, the drought driven by climate change is a key part of it. So in this pattern that you're finding uh, in these areas or countries that are exhibiting sort of the most extreme effects of climate change um, are also sort of uh, devastated by, as you put it, neoliberal economic restructuring or reform. But those, th those sort of reforms are specifically backed by uh, what I would see as completely un undemocratic institutions uh, like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. Um, so you, mm -hmm. can you speak a little bit more specifically on that topic? Because it seems uh, to me, at least the American left, are not really focused on how do we challenge or bring more accountability to institutions like the IMF, World Bank? The way to bring more accountability to the IMF and the World Bank would be by pressuring the U.S. government because the U.S. government is, you know, has a, a controlling shares and helps set the tone um, for, for those. So, yeah, we, it's true. Our movements have not done that. There was the whole anti-WTO protest, but since then, the whole kind of the critique of globalization has sort of dropped away, partly because, you know, the wars came along and there's, you know, always some new crisis. Now we have Trump. But, I mean, that would be the, the way to do it, is to, to, um, to pressure for a different notion of what development is. But there's other subtler ways, too, which is to you know, push back against the hegemony of laissez-faire economics wherever it is. And it's everywhere, right? It's in the press. It's in all the universities. And so part of why, the, why structural adjustment packages are not, they go by a different name now, right? It's poverty alleviation programs, I think. But, um, you know, part of why this stuff isn't more hotly contested in the U.S. is because there remains confusion about laissez-faire economics. And some of that, I think, has to do with being a little more sophisticated in terms of the history of capitalism, right? It's, it's really great now in this moment where socialism has a saliency it hasn't had for a long time and young people are critical of capitalism. But in being critical of capitalism, we also need to have a kind of historical sense of it and that there, there really was a different system of managing the, the global economy that comes out of the crisis of the Great Depression, the New Deal, World War II, that golden era of capitalism, right? There's, you know, the U.S. government supported through the World Bank and the IMF programs that today would, would seem downright socialistic, right? Extending loans for government-owned development projects in the global south, many of which were environmentally totally destructive, like major dams and stuff like that. But it's the crisis of that model uh, due to overaccumulation, the end of the kind of the rebuilding process of World War II, glutted markets that begin in the 1960s, late 60s, profit crisis that kicks in in the early 70s, rising labor militancy, which was fueled to some extent by the social safety net that had been built up in the U.S. under the New Deal and the war on poverty. And there's that 
fascinating decade of the 1970s where there's lots of labor militancy and it's kind of like a moment of class stalemate and it ends with Volcker being appointed to the chairman of the Federal Reserve jacking up interest rates Reagan comes in and you know the Reagan Thatcher revolution begins and and as part of that you know Keynesian economic theory is out and in come these previously marginalized ideas and characters Hayek and Milton Friedman, right. you know. Chicago boys. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, some of the work has to be about, you know, pushing back. And this is the work you guys are doing on the show, right? Is pushing back against the hegemony of those ideas, which seep into people's consciousness in, in very subtle ways, even. Hmm. You're a contributor to a recent book titled Anthropocene or Capitalocene, Nature, History, and the crisis of capitalism. It gets at the very important idea of replacing the and in the phrase capitalism and nature to an in. Uh, can you explain how replacing the simple word delivers a completely different analysis and why it's important for the left to start doing the same? Mm -hmm. So that book was edited by Jason Moore, who is a good friend of mine, and I, I got to know him through knowing his work first. Um, and, and Jason is not alone in this, but he's the most forceful in, in arguing that there is a real problem politically in seeing nature as this distinct thing that human beings are not part of and that society is separate from. And, um, you know, the, the, the implications of that kind of analysis are that, well, if nature is this pristine other, this thing, and we are intruders, then the solution is basically to kill yourself, right? And get out of the picture. And that's a political non-starter. Um, be the change you want to see and off yourself. Um, that people, don't, people aren't going to get into that. They're going to do that. It's also historically inaccurate. You know, uh, first of all, nature, this thing we call nature, is really just an agglomeration of organism-environment interactions. And every organism has an environment that it interacts with, and every organism is part of other organisms' environment. And all organisms are environment-making to some extent. This oxygen-rich atmosphere we have is the byproduct of a previous form of catastrophic climate change in which methane-breathing, oxygen-exhaling bacteria, you know, wiped themselves out essentially. Uh, beavers need beaver ponds, they don't find them, they make them. So too human beings have a long history of not only destroying environments, but also creating environments that are more fecund, have more biodiversity. And we have to recuperate that history and try and modernize it. So uh, an example I use all the time, because it's where we're sitting, is in the Northeast, right? The, the classic kind of romantic racism around Native Americans, that they tread lightly on the land, et cetera, et cetera. Turns out they didn't tread lightly. They burnt the entire landscape twice a year. And they were very robust and uh, active environment makers. But the effect of that burning was to create edge habitat, which increased game, particularly deer. And there was a whole number of other practices um, that Native Americans in the Northeast did. And now, you know, it's only been really like the last 30 years that this stuff has really taken on. One, the, the realization of the importance of fire in producing whole landscapes, like the Great Plains. It's, we now understand that like, you know, they were extended considerably by 300, at least 300 years of really aggressive native burning. Um, uh, Susan Hecht was one of the pioneers of this kinds of thinking, looking at the Amazon and realizing that the Amazon, Amazonia, the, the Amazon jungle is like a as much a garden as it is a wild zone that that indigenous people there are moving plants around and you know cultivating the whole thing so our role as a species historically speaking has not just been to denude and overfish and mess things up though you know we have done even before capitalism you know other modes of production we have done a fair amount of that we've done a lot of it but it's not it's not inevitable that human beings do that and it's not inevitable that our technologies only lead to that outcome. So we have to recuperate this other capacity of ours, which is that we are environment makers. We're currently unconscious environment makers. We're in total denial about our role as such. We need to become conscious of it, and we need to start making a habitable environment. And that gets into the question of technology, which we can maybe get into later. But mm -hmm. 
Last week, the Conference of Parties was held in Bonn, Germany. Um, though the United States was not there formally, they were there with a corporate panel supporting energy production, um, not of solar, wind, or geothermal, but coal, nuclear, and gas. Um, that's an aside, perhaps, uh, but it does set the stage for what seems to be a very scary path in, in terms of emission reductions. Can you explain what the COP is, or, or the Conference of Parties is, and if anything, what the conference is on track to achieve? Yeah, the the COP is a the conference of parties to the UNFCCC um, United Nations Framework on Climate Change. It comes out of the the Earth Summit of ninety two, and essentially an effort to to deal with climate change. And I don't follow the COP meetings that closely in part because um, I'm, I'm cynical that an international agreement is going to do much. I think that more importantly, uh, more important is what major economies are going to do. So I mean, we had an international agreement to limit greenhouse gas emissions, the Kyoto Protocol, and that's you know, the essential thing that the, the cops are now trying to negotiate a, a successor agreement, and they're failing to do so. But the Kyoto Protocol didn't really reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so what is going to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is if the large economies of the world that set the tone for better and for worse for other economies, uh, if they start making a transition to renewable energy. And that is to some extent happening in Europe, even here and in China. And it's happening often like in China where they've had really uh, substantial investments in renewable energy. It's happened not primarily because there's a concern about climate change, so that's developing, but because rather that there's a, a local air quality crisis and it's becoming impossible to get CEOs from Fortune 500 companies to move to Beijing because the air is so terrible and people of all classes in China are rebelling against this pollution. And so the state is having to take action. And uh, that means building out renewable energy. And so, you know, I think the, the real key question is, as the 600 plus million people in Africa who don't have regular electricity start getting access to electricity and similar numbers in India, right, where there are more poor people in India than all of sub-Saharan Africa, are they going to be using, for purely financial reasons, cheap, effective Chinese produced solar panels or is it going to be like oh buy a generator from General Electric and then you got to buy diesel to put in it these are the key questions right it would be great if if there was a if there was a good agreement and it would be really good if there was money made available to developing economies and and technology transfers but you know it's been such a long time and so little has happened and in the meantime what has happened is that the policies of major states have had some effect, you know. So we've got uh, Germany has made pretty significant transition to renewable energy. Places like Portugal, you know, it's a place you don't think of, like you know, on occasion, on, on windy, sunny days, like in the summer, Portugal's at seventy percent renewable energy. So those are the. I think those policies matter more. What what nation states are doing that are helping to create economies of scale that will then trickle down through the development process so that as people come online for electricity, the choice will be clean energy. Uh, many people tend to think of the effects of climate change as indiscriminate. Uh, this abstract notion of climate change, not taking into consideration that the global south, like you said, in places that have been historically underdeveloped often face the most devastating effects from climate change. Um, how does understanding the underdevelopment of these places help us to understand the unequal distribution of climate catastrophe and its inordinate effect on poor and marginalized communities? Like, in other words, um, why is climate justice important to understand, not just climate change? Yeah, climate, I mean, it's, all, it's all part and parcel of, you know, one big set of problems, right? If, if the planet was a country, it would be the most unequal country on the planet, right? The, the, the inequality between the global north and the global south is, is enormous and tremendous. And um, talking about issues that arise and then fall away, I mean, this is, this is pretty serious. So this, is, this was like the issue that drove the, the great anti-imperialist uh, 
movements of the post-World War II era, right, with decolonization. This was the central question, like the legacy of colonialism. And capitalism is born out of this process of, it's really, it's born out of the Colombian exchange and the, the, the exchange of diseases and animals and peoples between the Americas and the old world, the, the crisis of disease that weaken Native American societies and make them open to military conquest. And this geography has been crucial to capitalism from its birth, and it is central to how capitalism operates today, core and periphery, with the periphery exploiting the core. Not everyone in the periphery exploiting everyone in the core, but, um, you know, core, core states supporting the transnational firms that are housed there in their um, ransacking of the resources and labor of the global south. So this is, you know, th this question of underdevelopment and poverty in the global south uh, predates climate change. And now climate change is kicking in a fashion that affects the most vulnerable first. The, you know, um, farmers in the U.S. have a, a robust interventionist state behind them, though it denies it. So when they have bad crops, there's crop insurance. There's, the government underwrites crop insurance, and things are okay. And in countries that have not had that kind of power and autonomy that have been for 30 years forced to, in exchange for lifeline loans, I mean, it's really all getting back to the Volcker shock. The debt crisis begins with the Volcker shock because when interest rates essentially almost double in the U.S., that, that means they do so in large part for the rest of the world. And there had been lots and lots of cheap credit available in the 70s that was lent at uh, variable, low but variable interest rates. So then servicing these debts goes up. Mexico, Argentina, Brazil are the first countries to go into the debt crisis. And then slowly but surely it happens to one country after another. And in each one of these cases, this is then an opportunity for rich states through the Bretton Woods institutions of the IMF and World Bank to push the neoliberal agenda of privatizing state assets, deregulating markets, opening capital markets, cutting public spending on the social safety net, changing labor laws, et cetera, et cetera. So now in the global south, when there are floods, droughts, et cetera, in countries that have been subject to this kind of restructuring, people are incredibly vulnerable, in part because the government in many places doesn't have any kind of development program. They're not doing anything. Like, you know, if you go to northern Kenya, the government doesn't do anything except basically there's like kind of anti-banditry policing that's pretty minimal, and there's kind of like a, a famine response infrastructure that's always sort of waiting in the wings, and like that's it, right? The state is, has been systematically removed. So in... In arguing for climate justice, it, it's, you know, it, we're arguing for development. Development gets a bad name, but maybe because it gets a bad name, I like to use the word. People like, people get so trendy with their language. Mm -hmm. This word is in, that word's out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, I mean, the question is what kind of development? Um, so, so certainly um, adaptation to climate change involves, should involve redistribution of wealth and rebuilding the public sector. In, in the global south and developing economies and returning in, um, the power to states to, to guide their development. So Christian, uh, back in August, uh, you wrote a, a really piercing article for Jacobin titled, If We Fail. Um, in it, you very clearly spell out in detail the consequences of failing to act immediately on the issue of climate change and paint some pretty disturbing pictures. This dystopian future, you argue, is well on its way, um, and we'll be experiencing what you term a permanent emergency. First, define what you mean by uh, permanent emergency, and second, what are the strategies you see to organize the political will necessary to provide comprehensive solutions to this problem? Well, I mean, that, that, that article is looking at sea level rises. You know, I mean, climate change, what I was saying is that certain effects of climate change are going to kick in before others. And sea level rises are probably going to start damaging the U.S. economy and affecting the way we live before widespread crop failures and other stuff like that. Uh, that's partly because the oceans are not even. Uh, they're uneven. 
and they're also rising unevenly. In the North Atlantic, our side of the North Atlantic is, is rising faster than anywhere else. So inevitably, uh, it seems, um, there's going to be pretty major inundations of cities. We've already seen that. I mean, I wrote that over the summer before these hurricanes happened. And the thing was published like a week before all that happened. So I was just, I, I mean, I, 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 I try and stay away from speculative, um, you know, speculating about the future that much. But, you know, it's just trying to imagine what might the effects be of many, several major cities being inundated. And the process would be, you know, it's not that the sea is going to rise and stay there. I mean, eventually that would happen, but it's the threat of storm surges and then storm surges damaging urban infrastructure. And then the process of, you know, municipal level austerity and neoliberalism interacting with this rotting, corroding infrastructure, where does that lead? Could easily lead to processes of capital flight, evacuation of population and, and investment and a kind of, you know, a second urban crisis. It's hard to imagine now sitting in New York City, but right after one, one effect of that post-war boom and all this government subsidy for suburbanization and highway building, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, job flight to, to the U.S. South and beyond was the urban crisis. Cities like New York fell into this pattern of, of disinvestment and abandonment. Capital has since returned to the city. That's what you know, my first book, Lockdown America, was, was all about. It was like the, the criminal justice component that goes along with, with capital's return to these quote-unquote cockpit cities, fire, real estate, insurance-driven cities. So you could imagine a new climate-driven urban crisis where cities are inundated, the sea retreats, the infrastructure rots, capital leaves, you know, what happens? You could imagine all sorts of reactionary politics developing, but possibly also some radical new constituencies. Um, I understand that DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, down in Houston, has a bunch of activists who are involved in mucking out these, you know, toxic, disgusting homes. And there are, what, over, over 100,000 homes were flooded. 85% of them don't have flood insurance. You know, what happens to that? If we're talking about like five or six or seven cities like that, you know, and, and, and that constituency. Is every, is every one of those people just going to be like, well, we'll just sell for whatever we can and move inland? Or will there be some sort of coalescence and a new constituency developed around the question of the reproduction of society, right? And a kind of new class struggle in the, in the realm of reproduction, in the spaces of reproduction, neighborhoods, cities, infrastructure. Um, so that will only happen if there's the right kind of organizing and analysis to help it along. But that's the, you know, that's, that's taking a, a positive view on the potential change. But, you know, the, the less positive view is just like science is very clear that if we stop all uh, CO2 greenhouse gas emissions immediately today, we're still locked in for decades and decades of continued warming and continued sea level rises. So uh, seas are, you know, probably going to rise. The IPCC says, you know, probably about three feet in the next century. It could easily be more. So when that kicks in, um, what will happen as it kicks in? I guess it is kicking in to some extent. I mean, as, as, as we speak about cities and, and physical spaces, um, I'd like you to kind of comment on a familiar cliche for everyone on the left, which is thinking globally and acting locally. Um, and you commented before on the kind of quixotic localism um, you can find in the environmental movement, which you've stated kind of wrongly assumes that we can somehow disconnect from both the national and international markets, kind of growing and producing locally almost everything. Um, is this kind of naive rejection of anything ran by a market, national or international, the way forward? And if it isn't the way forward, which I assume you, you may say, then, then what is? What is that way of kind of solving? I mean, cliches are cliches for a reason. I... The way I approach this essentially is like the, the, the time frame that the science lays out is such that we don't have a lot of time, right? Uh, 
It's a compressed time frame. And that means we have to start making changes now. We have to start forcing these institutions to make these changes. And even if one um, it wants to take a hard line on capitalism's ability to change, say well, only socialism can create a, a um, sustainable society, which, well, let's be clear, socialism can also create unsustainable societies. Mm -hmm. um, but even if that's the case, well, well you know, is it going to have to do it uh, all at once, de novo, after inheriting a totally toxic, overbuilt uh, technological heritage from capitalism? Or isn't part of our job as socialists to try and make the technology of the society as green, as sustainable as possible, that that's inevitably part of the larger project? So when I talk about um, what sounds like, I mean, I don't endorse market solutions, but I'm just thinking about like, how do we get this society to do what it has to do? And we have a clear track record of that. Um, the, you know, Nixon presided over the creation of the EPA and the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, all those laws that the EPA enforces, and they have had a tremendous effect on cleaning up the environment. And why did this conservative right-wing Republican do that? Because he had to, because the biggest protest the world had ever seen at that time, Earth Day happened, because people were, you know, pressuring him. It was becoming a mainstream issue. People were sick of this disgusting, polluted air, right? I mean, because rivers were literally on fire. Yeah, right? river, yeah exactly. Litters were, rivers were literally on fire. Uh, bald eagles were extinct everywhere except, like, Alaska and zoos. Well, now and, they're going to be extinct because of uh, wind turbines, right? I mean, here. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you just slow... You just, yeah, yeah. Right. And it's, no, right. one, of the key th one of the key things on that one is you just <laughs> slow slow the wind turbines down. They get bigger, they get slower. Thank you. Or else you turn them off. You, Thank you, you for clearing you, that up. You hi hire, you hire ornithologists to say, here come the birds, and you turn off the wind, or, or wind turbines, like, for an hour while the birds fly through, and then, you know... I'm sure there are plenty of biology students who would love that job, working for the state of California, like spend all day looking at the sky when you tell wind turbines to turn off. No, but, but anyway. I mean, to, to, to your point, though, I mean, and, and please continue, I mean, we, we need state, national level solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? And it's not, that, it's not that, you know, community gardens and all this kind of stuff are no good. They are good. But what, but what we want be, is, you know, uh, there's no reason that the left should turn its back on the state just because the right wing and the economics profession has spent a generation telling everyone that we have to do that, right? Uh, the, the state is the only thing that can stand up to capital and discipline capital, and that's what Nixon was forced to do, right? The reason the Koch brothers go after the EPA is because they hate it, because it's expensive. Every dollar they have to spend on cleaning up their waste is a dollar they don't get to have. So... We, you know, we should be trying to imagine how the sort of localista, you know, anarcho-liberal fascination with local gardens and this sort of stuff can articulate with government action. And I think it can. And I think some of that, the reason my faith in this has to do with being raised in rural New England, where we have like participatory budgeting before it was named as such. It's called town meeting. And every March, people get together and they fight over how much money is going to go for the roads and how much money is going to go for the school and whether or not the, the fire truck is like, you know, needs to be traded in, and, you know, another one purchased. And, um, and then during, during the Hurricane Irene in, in Vermont, there was a, a huge outpouring of kind of volunteer effort. And people, due to the habit of town meeting, they connected to the town government and town governments coordinated and you know the state of Vermont would would still be in total disrepair if it wasn't part of this larger economy because the state of Vermont doesn't have the power to stand up to the largest employers in Vermont one of which is GE you know um, but the federal government can doesn't do it well enough but it can and it's redistributed some of that money to help Vermont rebuild its roads etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah I think it's very dangerous for the left to embrace this kind of anti-status stuff. And it's usually, I think, done unconsciously. And it's because people have to think with contradiction. Yes, government is bad, but government is also good. Government is SWAT teams kicking down your door on a bench warrant. Government is the overreach of child protective services. Government is this corrupt, you know, uh, bailout bureaucracies for corporations. But it's also you know, uh, free health care for millions of children, 
guaranteed public education. It's the force that turned what were open sewers, essentially, most of the streams of New England, into like clean streams. So the, the thing is not to reject government. We have to retake it. Mm. And if we're serious about taking on capital, I mean, you know, what institution is really going to be strong enough to take on capital? And capital will, of course, you know, historically, capital will defend itself with violence. And um, when push comes to shove, the question is, you know, what side does the state take? Um, I mean, just to finish off what you wrote in that piece and, and kind of the role of government, I mean, <clears throat> you spoke a little bit about a, a certain technology which can strip carbon from the atmosphere. However, one of the big problems with it was that in terms of a free market or a market economy, there's no possible way that it would scale because the cost of um, yeah. the actual process is too much. Can you just walk us through that one example of how uh, the state's role in scaling up a particular technology you know, has a very real um, effect on the conversation around climate change? Mm -hmm. um, there was two things about that. One is like I'm trying to make the case against cynicism, right? The easy case to make around climate change is that we're doomed. That's, that's intellectually an easy case to make because that is probably what's happening. However, uh, and then invoking hope for hope's sake isn't good enough. So how do you make a credible case for not giving up hope? And I think technology is central to that. And there, you know, we are at uh, 405 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. The science is pretty clear that around 350 is where the tipping points are, at which point, you know, the process of climate change becomes self-fueling. So out, we have to... Shout out to Bill McKibben, who's 350... Uh, mm -hmm. and, and to uh, Jim Hansen, who, 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 who sort of located that as the tipping point, even though Jim Hansen has what I consider to be rather naive ideas about the political economy of atomic power. Um, you can create, in a nutshell, you can create safe atomic power plants, but they're so expensive and they take so long to build that it's not really feasible. So the point was to just, you know, if, if you know, how do you, how do you deal with this fact? Um, we have to, we have to be realistic about how we strip CO2 out of the atmosphere. Well, those technologies exist. Then the problem was like, how do you store it? You store CO2 as a critical gas underground, it leaks out, you're right back where you started. Uh, you know, and so there's been this invention in Iceland where they have figured out how to turn CO2 into rock, essentially. Yes, it is extremely expensive. Therefore, the market isn't going to deliver this. The private sector is not capable, isn't going to deliver this. It has to be, um, it has to be a, a public sector venture. And I'm not saying that I think this would, would happen, but it's just that this could happen. We have the money. Right? There's a huge military budget. Uh, corporations are sitting on vast amounts of cash, uninvested. This is beyond what they give to their shareholders. We even have the laws if we push them. Um, you know, the Clean Air Act is amended by the lawsuit Massachusetts versus EPA, uh, which said in 2007 that the federal government must regulate, the EPA must regulate greenhouse gas emissions. And the Bush administration, the Obama administration, now the Clinton Trump administration basically ignored this. Obama did two easy things on this front, but mostly ignored this. So we've got all the pieces. We have the technology. We have electric vehicles. We have distributed solar. We've got concentrated, you know, utility scale wind. We've got all the pieces, and we just have to put it together. And state planning, state ownership, that is the only way forward, as I see it. So, I mean, that's what that was about, was about trying to disabuse people of a kind of cynicism and um and also to make the case simultaneously that you know for state action there's no way a lot of what needs to happen is going to happen on on the basis of you know money making Christian, what, what is green austerity and how is it connected to the concept of reduce reuse recycle um and why should we be uh, wary of it um, well, I guess that means, you know, just this, this hair shirt environmentalism that a politics of personal consumption. And, um, I, I, I think that's a non-starter politically because, uh, first of all, a lot of consumption is pre-structured for us, right? Most people who commute by automobile in this country do so not because they prefer it to some other means, but it's the only way they can get around, right? So if, if our politics is to 
to give people grief for driving to work. It's like, you know, a lot of them, they don't like that. They, you know, they prefer not to have to do that. So it's, it's like a neoliberal concern. Yeah, it's a, neo, it's a neoliberal yeah. thing. It's, it's methodological individualism. It lets the, the structural problems off the hook. And um, yeah. And I mean, and getting back to the climate justice thing, I mean, that, you know, I mean, what climate justice emerges out of this, you know, environmental justice movement in the early 90s, which was about trying to bring into focus for the, the predominantly white upper middle class environmental movement that these fence line communities, as they're called, if you look at where people are suffering the most, it's, you know, people who, like in Richmond, California, who live right next to the Chevron refinery or in Cancer Alley and along the Mississippi River or any number of places. And, you know, why did they live in these places? Ah, because of like racist redlining, because they're working class. And it's like, you know, to try and connect the older politics of racial and class justice to the the politics of, of sustainability and of, of um, saving ourselves as a civilization, as a species. You spoke, you spoke a little bit about this earlier, but how do you conceive of the connection between uh, building a socialist movement and building an environmental movement? Because I think it's lost on some self-proclaimed socialists that an environmental movement, quote unquote, need not be socialist or even anti-capitalist at all. Uh, but can we actually live in a capitalistic framework while trying to preserve life on the planet as we know it? Do we need a dramatic restructuring of our social relations and the mode of production to battle uh, what is quite possibly environmental disaster? Yes. I mean, we can do both. Yes to both questions. Yes, yes, we can move in the right direction under capitalism. And yes, we must overcome capitalism. Capitalism is not sustainable. Is capitalism... Uh, capable of change and reform yes it is I mean, we have a long history of that once upon a time the cities of the united states were constantly barraged by epidemics because the the streets were filled with the, the corpses of dead animals and piled high with human and animal excrement and that didn't just go away organically that happened because there were movements to say we have to make it illegal to do this and we've got to have public investment to create sewers below ground etc cetera, etc cetera. so capitalism has um has has reformed itself and i think a key distinction is between capital and capitalism right like capital the the, the process of um using exchange value to control labor power for the production of more exchange value with which to do more of the same. That process can't do that. But that process embedded in a society that has other institutions and in which that process and the elites who benefit from that process are subject to laws that are not only of their creation, but also produced partly in response to social movements that arise from below and demand, um, you know, control and containment and reshaping of capital in the process. So, so certainly capitalism, capitalist society can be reformed because it has. Capital, no. Can it be reformed to the point where there's some sort of sustainable capitalism? No, right? We live on a finite planet. Not every single beach can be turned into a sandals resort. Not every, you know, mountain can be, you know, blown up for whatever or lies inside of it. There's got to be some sort of a, an, an end to economic growth, a steady state economy. And I'm, I'm critical of that whole kind of environmental economics of Herman Daly and others like that because they think, I mean, they're fine people, the ones I've met, and they mean well, but you know, they think that you can basically trick capital via the, the price signals into being sustainable. And I don't think that's possible. But you can, through force of law, say, here you may not dump your toxic waste, and over there you may not cut down every tree. And if you do, you know, we're coming after you, we're coming after your money, and if you push hard enough, you know, we'll put you in jail. You know, and that's how it works. So, so that's, that's, that's how I see that question. And, and I think it's important to, um, to take these reformist struggles seriously and try and push them, push them for their radical potential. And for socialists and revolutionaries, uh, 
I think that they should take seriously the question of like, okay, well, well, what what kind of technological base do you want to inherit? And as a classical Marxist, you know, I mean, Marx didn't say a lot about socialism. I mean, he didn't say a lot about socialist innovation of technology, right? So one thing we know capitalism is good at is innovating and developing technologies. And it never does that. Capital never does that on its own, right? Mm -hmm. The railroads weren't the product of capital. The railroads started with massive grants of public land and contracts to move the mails that subsidize the railroads, et cetera, et cetera. So is it an optimistic or pessimistic view for the uh, future of mankind and Christian Parenti? Well, I mean, I, get, I think I have to just... Uh, I mean, honestly, I'm pretty pessimistic, to be perfectly honest. But um, that is... I don't think that that's entirely rational, and I have devoted the last couple of years several years to, to making this credible case for optimism. So there is a credible case for optimism, and it is that we have all the pieces that we need, and uh, you know we have the technology, we have the money, we even have the laws. It's just a matter of the political will and the political movements to force the state to do the right things. And you know, I, I'm put in mind of the, the situation of the miners who were trapped in um, Ecuador, Peru, I think it was, and they were, this was several years ago, you know, and there was, they were, they were trapped and it wasn't it's rational. In Chile. To Chile. Chile. It was in Chile. That's right. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. They were, you know, they were trapped and it was not rational for them to think they were going to be found, but they didn't just freak out and, and eat what food they had and drink what water and then die. They, they organized themselves. They, everybody, they created a watch system. They shared the food and water out very carefully. They made special dispensations for the few very young miners who'd never been through anything like this. And irrationally, they saved themselves. They rationed what resources they had, and then lo and behold, they were found. If they hadn't done that, which was irrational at a certain level, they wouldn't have survived. So I think that's the situation we're in. We have to act like it's possible. We have to have you know, a rationalism. To, to modify Gramsci's thing about pessimism of the mind, optimism of the will, it's like we have to have a kind of a rationalism of the mind and a kind of irrational sense about politics and just do this. And... Fidel Castro actually put it really well. He was asked by um, some uh, intellectuals about this stuff. And he said, even if human society only has 10 years left to live, uh, we still have to struggle. You know, like why, if there's only a decade left, like why should the rich have everything? Why should things be so oppressive? Why should life be so miserable for everybody, right? And that's what socialism and the struggle for social justice should be about, about making things better for people right here, right now. Not like, oh, we all suffer and have to do this extra work so that the future is better. That's like religious nonsense. No one wants to do that. That's why, that's why Bernie was, was so successful, right? Because he was like, yes, socialism, this abstraction, was broken down into real solutions in real time for real people. It's like, yeah, dealing with your student debt, dealing with health care, creating jobs. That really appeals to people. Well... Christian Parenti, thank you very much for sitting down with uh, Left Out. It was a we pleasure. appreciate it. Thank you. My, my pleasure. So thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of Left Out. Uh, special thanks to Christian Parenti, obviously, for being so generous with his time and sitting down with uh, me, Paul, and Mike. Um, special thanks also to our audio engineer, as always, Corey Morgart, who does wonderful work for us. Um, thank you to Democracy at Work. And of course, all of you who make this endeavor possible and enjoyable, uh, please support us in any way you can. If not through Patreon, then a like, a share on social media, or uh, rate and review the podcast, uh, which really, really helps us out uh, more, than, more than you would know. Yeah, and uh, before we go, a little update here. I'd like to let everyone out there know that Left Out has a voicemail um, for which all you Left Out listeners can call and leave comments questions, criticisms, hopefully to improve the program um, for you and, and also for us. I mean, we want to make this enjoyable and, and as listenable as possible. Um, what we're going to also be doing is before we interview guests, uh, we will let you know who we're, who we're interviewing and we hope that you can call in, leave a, a question on the left out voicemail and we'll be able to get those comments stitched into the audio of our episode if you make it clear that you'd like it to be so so please give a call don't be shy and we'll be putting that number out on our patreon 
and other social media accounts. Um, also, just to give you guys a heads up and maybe start working on those questions and calls, next month we plan to sit down with Kali Akuno of Cooperative Jackson, which is a cooperative network based in Jackson, Mississippi, that focuses on work in terms of creating, promoting, and developing networks of cooperatives to empower black and brown communities which are historically underserved and marginalized. I'm super excited about the episode. It's going to be really great to sit down with not just an academic or theoretician, but a guy who's, who's out in the, in the field, in the grassroots, actually making big doing. moves, actually doing yeah. uh, you know, what, what needs to be done, yeah, doing so the good work. So. Please, please tune into that episode. Definitely. Um, it's going to be exciting. Thanks again for all the support, and we hope you enjoyed this episode of Left Out.